We are coming to Romans chapter eight. I, I think that this chapter has to be just one of the most glorious chapters in all of scripture. Um, we, we have looked at chapter seven, which talks about the law. And we've seen, although the law is good, the law is weak. It cannot save us. In fact, the only way that we can walk in victory is through living by the spirit, life in the spirit. And this chapter, this glorious chapter of Romans 8, Paul begins to unfold what it means to live by the spirit. It's an amazing chapter and it just creates a hunger and a passion within us, a hunger for the spirit. So it's too glorious, this chapter, to do in one hit. So uh, we're going to take from Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read to verse 17 today. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. Life through the Spirit. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. <clears throat> Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. <clears throat> the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. If the spirit of God lives in you and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. We give thanks to God for his amazing, spirit-breathed, God-inspired word. So, here we go. Pastor Wana Archer tells about a time when he was a teenager and worked at a restaurant for 25 cents an hour. In this restaurant, there happened to be a gambling machine that looked like a pinball machine. What would happen is a player would deposit a nickel and get one shot to hit the jackpot or win some money. He noticed that people would get a quarter worth of nickels to play after it had been played set by several people he worked out that it would get close to paying off 
he got to where he could determine when that was. And as a result, just nipping in at the right time, he'd get a quarter worth of nickels and play. You'd win $2, which was a whole day's wages. When school started back, he had given up that job, but he would walk near the restaurant and he'd think about that gambling machine. He'd go in and put in a nickel and lose, just like all those other customers he'd watched lose. He did this several times. And it dawned on him over time that he'd become addicted to gambling. And so he talked to the Lord about this. What am I going to do? The Lord made it clear that he had to stay clear of that gambling machine. If it meant going a block out of the way so he wouldn't be tempted, then that is what he must do. And he did. In time, as he resisted the pull to gamble, he noticed the desire to gamble left him. He yielded his life to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit fulfilled the law of righteousness in his life. And as a result, he experienced peace and life and not death. Do you know, the big question coming off the back of chapter seven, going into chapter eight is this. How can we walk in victory? How can we walk in victory over the passions and the desires of our sinful nature? How can we live in victory over our flesh life, over this sinful nature? You see, just to remind ourselves, back in chapter seven, Paul has established that there are three dynamics at play. He has identified the sinful nature, which all of us, it's in our day at DNA. You know, all of us have that bit of Adam's DNA in us. Then Paul has identified the law, and now he's moving us towards the spirit of God. And as he's looked at these three dynamics, the sinful nature, the law, and the spirit of God, Paul has identified, it's really good for us to remind ourselves, Paul has identified three principles at work. First of all, he has said that he has identified that the law is good, but he's also identified that the law is powerless. The law cannot save us. However hard we try to fulfill it, we will always fall short of it. In fact, the law cannot make us righteous. It can show us how we've fallen short of it, but it actually cannot make us holy. It is not a means of justification. It is not a means of sanctification. That's what we've discovered about the law. And Paul, moving on from that, has identified the internal tug of war between the sinful nature and our willpower. The sinful nature is stronger than willpower. If we try to fulfill the law in our own strength, we always fall over. Even if our heart is to be righteous, willpower so often gets us so many times it leaves us defeated and so we're left in the position how can we walk in victory and now Paul is bringing in the Holy Spirit Paul has identified to us that victory over the sinful nature is by the Holy Spirit it's through this new way of the Holy Spirit and that is because the Holy Spirit is more powerful than willpower. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than our sinful nature. The Holy Spirit is holy. It's only the Holy Spirit that can enable the law to be fulfilled in our lives. What is established then is that we are called to life in the Spirit. As we live by the Spirit, we walk in victory over the sinful na nature. Look at verse 11. I have to say verse 11 is just so brilliant. It says this. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you and that same uh, is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Now, this is an incredible truth. The spirit of God 
is living in you. And that same spirit that had the power to bring Jesus back to life, that same spirit that broke the chains of death, that same spirit that moved the stone, that breathed life into Jesus, that same spirit and that same power is at work in you and in me. Now, this is an amazing dynamic. When we submit to the spirit, when we yield our lives to the spirit of God, it enables, it releases the power of God to lead us into victory. The sinful nature is strong. Our willpower is weak. The law is weak, but the spirit of God is dynamic. The spirit of God is victorious. The spirit of God leads us into victory. The key is that we have to submit to the spirit of God. What an amazing truth for those in Christ Jesus. The spirit of God is living in you. Now, this is the dynamic and power at play here in our lives. So in context, chapter seven was about the law and its weakness. Now, chapter eight, as we move into chapter eight, this is about the spirit and about his strength. Seven was about law and weakness. Eight is the spirit and his strength. In fact, for those of you who like stats, the spirit of God is mentioned 21 times in this chapter. In other words, this is a chapter devoted to this new way of the spirit. And so the question that just strikes us from this chapter is this, what does it mean to live by the spirit? What does it mean to live by the Holy Spirit? Three things that I want to draw out in this section of chapter eight. First of all, when we live by the spirit, when we are filled by the spirit, when the Holy Spirit indwells us, what we find is that God gives us a new mindset, a new mindset. Look at verse five. It says this, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. You know, the Greek term here for mindset is phronine, phronine. And phronine is a word that denotes your worldview. It's not just simply what is where your thoughts are, are going at any particular moment. It's bigger than that. Phronine denotes worldview. It determines how you perceive the world, determines how you live in the world. It determines how you view the world. In modern times, people have adopted new mindsets. New mindsets have emerged, such as the new atheism. That's like purported by people like Philip Pullman and Richard Dawkins. It's like this new atheism. There's also been a rising up of new hedonism. Just a desire just to live a hedonistic life. Also, we've seen a fun, uh, uh, an Islamic fundamentalism, which is known as the new imperialism. But do you know what? When we receive the Holy Spirit, when our lives are filled, when the Holy Spirit indwells us, he, he gives us a new mindset. In Christ, we have the mind of Christ. We are transformed by the renewal, the renewing of our minds. Actually, our minds are filled with the Holy Spirit. And what Paul says here is that when our minds are filled with the Spirit, our minds are set on what the Spirit desires. What does the Spirit desire? Well, look at Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. It's the desire of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. As the Holy Spirit transforms our mind, the outflow of this is that our mind 
becomes set on what the spirit desires. Actually, when we allow the spirit to fill our minds, a beautiful thing happens. Verse six, the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Actually, the Holy Spirit brings a peace to our minds. It's the prayer of Philippians 4. Philippians 4 says this, and the peace of God, which transcends, which is beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, this mindset is not merely an intellectual value judgment, not at all. Paul says, when the Holy Spirit renews your mind, it is peace. It is life. It is a peace which is beyond the ordinary, a peace which is beyond understanding. There are things in our lives that, that confuse us, trouble us, that we just cannot fathom. That's when God's peace moves in. The peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so life in the spirit is a new mindset. But secondly, we see that life in the spirit is an absolute reassurance. Look at verses nine and 10. It says, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. The assurance here is wonderful. Basically, what Paul is saying here is that it is absolutely impossible to belong to Christ without having the spirit of Christ. What is he? He says it in the negative in verse nine. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if you flip that, it says, if you have the spirit of Christ, that's a guarantee that you belong to Christ because you can't have Christ without the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not only the reassurance of belonging, it's actually the reassurance of eternal life. Paul says your spirit is alive. You know, um, I think sometimes as Christians, we can have doubts as to whether we've received the Holy Spirit. But what Paul is saying here is that it's impossible to have Christ without having the Holy Spirit. And this is really important. Actually, this is all about being born again. It's all about the new birth of Jesus. I wanna be 100% clear with you today. When we open our hearts to Jesus, actually technically, mechanically, the process is this, as we open our hearts to Jesus, our spirit comes into union and connects with God's spirit. And out of the union of God's spirit and our spirit, out of that union, something new is birthed in our lives. And what we're saying, what, what actually this is totally in the slot of what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus. Look, you can't see the spirit, but you can see the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus, if you're going to come to God, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus is struggling to get his head about it. What, what, how can I enter my mother's womb again? And, and Jesus says, no, you're missing the point. This is about new birth. And that new birth is actually a spiritual transaction. That new birth is when God's spirit comes into union with our spirit and something new is birth. If you open your heart to Jesus, God's spirit comes into your life and that union takes place. It is absolutely guaranteed to happen. It's absolutely certain. If you open your heart in faith to Jesus, your spirit will connect with his spirit and something new is birthed which is called the new birth. Yes, there are moments in our walk with Jesus when we can have a renewed sense of the spirit. There are times in our walk when we can have an overwhelming sense of the spirit or we can have an overflow of the spirit. 
as we walk along, I pray that we would be filled, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would know a fresh anointing of God's Spirit every day. But the reality is, for all those in Christ Jesus, we have the Spirit of Christ. And this Spirit of and this spirit of God will bring life to our mortal bodies. Why? Because it's the same spirit that brought the resurrection to Jesus will give us new resurrection bodies as well. So what we're saying here in this chapter, what Paul is saying is this. Look, our sinful nature is powerful. The only way we can overcome it, the only way that we can walk in victory is by the power of the Holy Spirit, by opening our lives to the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, he fills our minds and he gives us a new mind set and, and we become what we think. We live this life of holiness as the Spirit brings out spiritual desires in us. He fills our minds, but we also see that as we come to him, he fills our lives. Something new is birthed in us. This is nothing short of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What a glorious truth this is. What a glorious truth. Christ filling our minds, Christ filling our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. So living by the Spirit, life in the Spirit is a new mindset. Life in the Spirit is an absolute reassurance. But thirdly, last but not by no means least, we see that life in the spirit is an intimate relationship. Verses 15 to 16. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Do you know, this is actually a position of complete and absolute security. Can, can you see what the Spirit does for us? The Spirit brings us a peace of mind. Oh, how our troubled minds need his peace dwelling in our minds. But it's also this great assurance. Oh, how we need the assurance of God in an, insert, in a, in an uncertain and changing world. But lastly, we see this absolute security the holy spirit what we see then is that the holy spirit who gives us new birth also confers adoption on us he gives us the right to be called children of god and then he adopts us into his family and gives us the right to call him father do you know the spirit of adoption is in complete juxtaposition with the slavery of fear. Do you know, if you are bound by fear, if you are bound by a fear of punishment or a fear of condemnation or a fear of not good, being good enough or a fear of not having people's approval or a fear of man or a fear, do you know, a fear of the future, a fear of the past, whatever that slavery of fear the, the antidote is the spirit of adoption. It's knowing that you're a child of God. You know, the I'm really laying it out here today. The spirit of adoption delivers us from insecurities. It delivers us from anxieties. It delivers us from a performance-driven life that seeks to win the approval of others. The spirit of adoption releases a cry within us, which is Abba. The spirit of adoption makes us secure in our identity. The spirit of adoption leads us to a place of intimacy with our father. The spirit within us testifies that we are children of God. who's given us new birth and now has given us the rights of sonship and daughterhood. Listen to the testimony of Howell Harris, the famous Welsh evangelist and the work of the Spirit in his life. This is what happened when Howell was filled with the Holy Spirit, June the 18th, 1735. He says, being in secret prayer, 
I felt suddenly my heart melting within me like wax before the fire with love to God, my saviour, longing to be dissolved and to be with Christ. Then was a cry in my inmost soul, which I was totally unacquainted with before. Abba, Father, Abba, Father. I could not help calling God my father. I knew I was his child and that he loved me and heard me. My soul being filled and satiated, crying, tis enough. I am satisfied. Do you know, I, I actually think that this is a filling of our emotions. We walk in a position of real security and intimacy with the father as the spirit cries out within us. Can you see what the work of the spirit is here? Can you see what it means to have life in the spirit? He fills our body and he will bring life to our bodies. He will bring a resurrection body. He fills our minds and he brings peace to our troubled thoughts. And he, he fills our soul and our spirit. And that leads to this intimate relationship, body, mind, soul and spirit. There is no area of our life that is not touched when we simply yield ourselves to the spirit of God. So there we have it. What does it mean to live by the spirit? It means and this is God's work. This is God's work in us. It means a new mindset. It means an absolute reassurance. It means an intimate relationship. Do you know, I, I believe there's a deeper cry. I believe there's a deeper cry within us, a hunger to go deeper when deep calls to deep. I believe if you listen closely enough, if you're attentive enough, to what's going on inside of you, I believe you will find a deeper longing, a longing for your father, a longing to come home, a longing for this Holy Spirit just to fill body, mind, soul and spirit. Do you know, my encouragement is this in light of this teaching, in light of this passage is just to yield, yield to the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, I cannot live this life in my own strength. I want to live it in yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.